Influencing popular culture, politics, and everything in between. The local station takes you ringside as we discuss the crazy world that is professional wrestling. This is Going Ringside with The Local Station. Hello there, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Going Ringside, episode 22 today. Um, We had a good reaction last week to our focus on Melina Perez, who joined us, as well as women's wrestling. Uh, It was a fun show and just a lot of good um, response to it. Want to once again remind you, if you haven't already, Go to at Going Ringside on either Instagram or TikTok. Follow us there. We are putting a lot of exclusive content on the wrestling world every day that you won't see on the podcast. And please continue uh, spreading the word about the show. We are still a new show trying to get the word out there that we are there. So wrestling fans know where to find us. Um, today we are doing a, a, a case that... Seems like it's a wrestling angle, but it wasn't. It was a real life uh, criminal investigation out in the city of Tallahassee, Florida, that involved Chris Jericho, real name Christopher Irvine. I'm saying that because that's how it's listed in these several police reports I got from Tallahassee PD that we're going to go through today. Um, So it's an interesting case of the All Elite Wrestling brand new heavyweight title A day after Chris Jericho won it for the first time in 2019, someone stole it in the city of Tallahassee. I want to start the show by saying, Chris, if you're by chance listening, we'd love to have you on the show to talk more about it. If you want to come on, you're welcome anytime to talk about this case or any other thing going on in the wrestling world. You're welcome. Just reach out. We would love to have you on. Um, But I wanted to talk about what happened in this case because there's been some write-ups over the Internet Nothing really ever delved into all of it. Um, And some of it, after going through these police reports, didn't make a ton of sense. It's a little confusing. So I brought in a veteran police detective, a guy who's retired, um, to help me analyze it, named Tom Hackney. And Tom um, was the chief over all the detectives for the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, which is possibly the biggest police agency in Florida, maybe one of the biggest in the entire country at a local level. He was overseeing all the detectives in his agencies. He was the supervisor. He was the guy who was out there um, doing a lot of high profile murder, kidnapping, all sorts of cases for years. And he would supervise all the detectives in his agency. He knows everything there is about detective work of all the police uh, officers I've ever worked with. He knows as much as anyone. So I I had him look through these reports with me and we're going to talk to him a little later on in the show about what's the deal here. Some of it didn't totally make a lot of sense and we'll get to that. So we're going to interview Tom a little later in the show. So I want to go back to kind of how this started. This was September 1st, 2019, when the belt was stolen in Tallahassee. Some confuse this as a wrestling angle. It was not, even though it kind of seems that way. This seems like something that would happen in the wrestling world, but this was a legit missing title belt in the city of Tallahassee. So where were we? AEW was still in its infancy. They had done their announcement that they were starting a Jacksonville-based promotion with the Khan family um, in early 2019. And then over several months, we heard they were going to get their TNT deal that eventually AEW Dynamite would start going on TNT each week, which was really what made them a major force in the wrestling world because they had that national TV contract primetime on TNT. They're now on TBS's Dynamite. They've, of course, got shows on TNT, three shows I think weekly AEW does now. Um, so this is weeks before the TNT deal started. They'd done some house shows around the country, and I think they did two pay-per-views. The pay-per-view that was, of course, important to this story was all out in 2019. It was on August 31st in Chicago. Jericho beats Hangman Adam Page in a grueling main event, and he becomes the very first AEW champion. This is kind of a big deal for the company to name your first champion weeks before you really go national on TNT and introduce your brand to a much broader audience. It's a big deal. The belt, the champion, the the build up to the promotion. And then this happens. So what happens? 
Chris Jericho and some people are flying back from Chicago to Tampa. Chris, real name Christopher Irvine, lives in the greater Tampa area. And Jacksonville, on the other side of the state, is where All Elite Wrestling is based. That's where the, kind of the comp- corporate offices are. So his plane, the police report says, was diverted from Chicago to Tallahassee. They had to land in Tallahassee. Tallahassee does not have a big airport. Medium-sized city, medium-sized airport. Um, but that's where they land. And so when they land, uh, Chris has a Suburban through a limo service waiting for him to drive him around. And when they land, he and his party tell the driver they want to go to Outback Steakhouse to get something to eat. They load up all their luggage. And the driver, and it says in the police report, says uh, he recommends a different location. He recommends going to a different um, steakhouse, which is where they go. They go to Longhorn. And this is kind of when the story gets a little confusing because they leave in the suburban from the airport to Longhorn um, and they find out that they had accidentally packed someone else's luggage into their suburban with them. They had the wrong person's luggage. They had their own luggage plus some extra from some other guy. So they start calling and trying to figure out who this other guy is. They want to return the luggage. So the driver, and this is kind of important, drops Chris and his party off at the Outback Steakhouse in Tallahassee and then says, I'm going to go back to the airport, bring these people their luggage back, and then I'll come back and get you guys at Outback. So the driver for the limo company we've chosen here, we've made the editorial decision to not name any other parties in this case because in the end, there were no criminal charges filed. So we will, we will describe them by who they were rather than by their names. Um, and so the driver goes to the airport and then returns to the outback. And this was kind of an odd part. Parts of these police reports were a little confusing and ambiguous. I want to read you this sentence of when the driver returns and goes into the outback to find Chris. Not outback, excuse me, the Longhorn. Um, He goes in the restaurant, this is a quote from the report, looking for someone, and he was trying to flag the driver down, but it was ignored. Irvine, Jericho, said he was sitting in front of the business and could be seen right away, so he doesn't know what he was doing. So it sounds like the driver walked in looking around and just totally looking past Jericho, and that was a little confusing. But eventually, they contact, they make connection in the outback. They go back out, um, and... The Longhorn, excuse me, I keep saying Outback, I mean Longhorn. Um, He says, um, the driver went outside and came back in to tell Jericho his belt was missing from the back area of the SUV. So Jericho calls law enforcement. They contact his employer, it says, which would be an AEW based in Jacksonville. Like, how much is his belt worth? We've got to do like a, um, you know, a missing property report with police department. This is how much they said the AEW title is worth, $29,250. So around 30 grand. That's an expensive belt. That's a big item. This is a grand theft level type case. So detectives show up or initial officers show up and start investigating, start asking questions, which is what they do. They're trying to get their story together. And so they start questioning the driver of the Suburban. This is uh, what the detective, what the investigator wrote in the initial police report. Things were not making sense and I wanted to ask more specific questions. So I read the driver his Miranda warning um, and he agreed to speak with me. Now it's not clear that when he read his Miranda warnings, if he was arrested and taken into custody, just said he was Mirandized and he would give his story that he was away from the belt for about two minutes while he used the bathroom with the vehicle was unlocked and, and um, and it sounds like someone could have accessed the vehicle if they wanted to. Um, and then at the end of this paragraph, it says, the driver refused to provide sworn written statement. And then they brought down a forensics team and they started to process the vehicle, looking for anything. They started going through ser- security cameras. Now this driver, because it said he was the last guy to see the belt, was listed at the time when the initial report was uh, written as a suspect, but it does not appear he was charged with a crime, but he was Mirandized. They had the uh, the manager of the limo service come down, um, provided a picture of the driver's call log as well as his GPS information for the vehicle. 
So at this point, police have stuff, but they don't have enough. They don't quite know how the belt is, goes missing. And then they go back to the airport to kind of check out when the driver went to drop off that wrong luggage earlier in the evening. Um, they started asking questions around the airport, looking for more details. A person at the airport stated, the terminal's camera system is not currently functioning, and a specialized technician would be arriving the next day to fix the system. So at this point, police kind of hit um, a bit of a dead end at this point. The, the belt is missing, a report has been filed, and that's kind of where it's at right now. Um, I want to, before I get to the Jericho um, social media post, I want to read one other thing. Um, yeah, they hadn't found much more. So Chris Jericho, ever the showman, when his belt is missing, knowing this is kind of a big deal, goes on social media. Guys, let's put up the first social media post. This is him on Instagram. Now, if you remember Chris during this time in 2019, this is right when AEW started, he was doing the La Champion, little bit of the bubbly gimmick was really his persona back then. So he puts this um, Instagram post of him in a hot tub uh, talking about someone, some lowlife, stole his AEW title. So at this point, it kind of, I could see how a wrestling fan, the community in general, would kind of be confused. Is this real life or is this wrestling? Because as you know, if you watch wrestling, the goal oftentimes is to, you know, blur reality and fiction. So let's hear what, uh, just an excerpt of what Chris put on Instagram after his title was stolen. Some low-life scumbag committed grand larceny and robbed me of the AEW championship. Now, as I sit here in my palatial estate, in my beautiful mansion, getting ready to have a little bit of the bubbly, I'm just imagining what I would do to that son of a if he was here right now. So he puts that out on Instagram, goes all over the place, um, and people start taking notice. So I was kind of trying to analyze media coverage of the event when, when Jericho puts this out and people start getting knowledge of what had happened. It had some impact on the media, but it wasn't a major story. And I think there's some interesting points there. I see nationally, New York Post picked it up, um, uh, TMZ, a couple other websites. Um, and local on the local level, because oftentimes when you have a big national story, local stations all over the country will carry it. The only local um, stations, like local media outlets I could see covering it were the Tallahassee Democrat newspaper, some TV sta smaller TV stations in Tallahassee, and one in Dothan, Alabama. So it didn't penetrate the collective consciousness too much. Wrestling fans knew about it because wrestling fans stopped follow this stuff. I was, you know, reporting the news at the time like you usually do here in Jacksonville, and I knew I, it was going to be a struggle to pitch this as a story. There's a few things that go with the, probably the media um, analyzing whether or not to put this on the news or on a website or wherever. One was All Elite Wrestling hadn't really formed yet, and there wasn't a national understanding of what it was like it is today, because as I said, they were a about to start their TNT deal. They were still in the formative time. And then also you have to convince people in the media, the vast majority of which don't watch wrestling, that this isn't a fake thing for the show. Because there was that suspicion. Which gets me to a, a wrinkle in this investigation. So along the way, police start getting calls. I wanna read you, they had, so I got five reports from Tallahassee PD. I had the initial reports that I told you about, some, and they have what are called supplementals. When new things come up in the case, they do supplemental reports. This is one of them, and then we'll, later on we'll get to the final report in the case. One of the supplementals involved when the duty officer at Tallahassee PD received several calls from various citizens stating the championship belt had been posted for sale on Facebook in the Tallahassee marketplace. So I'm going through one here that was posted in the Tallahassee um, Facebook marketplace. This is what the guy wrote. Found this thing by North Monroe Nail Salon. Weighs about 14 pounds, really big on my waist. Smells like champagne and body oil. Thought about wearing it to work. 
but uh, it would make my coworkers jealous. So one of the tells I think that this was fake is, which is what it was, was the whole smells like champagne and body oil. You get the sense a wrestling fan wrote that. They probably knew Jericho's gimmick, uh, body oil, they're poking fun at body oil and wrestling. So you get the sense that this might be fake. Still, um, the police department starts doing their due diligence. Um, they put a preservation request to Facebook where you preserve the, this uh, post so it's not taken down so police can analyze it. And then they were used, uh, David, which is their background check system, how they, um, the system that they use to identify people, they were able to identify the owner of this, uh, this page and track him down. And then they went and started, they went to his house. He agreed to a search um, and they started searching the house. They didn't find the belt and they realized this was fake um, for a few reasons. The photo included in the post returned to the first Google image search for AEW championship belt. It was from Forbes magazine article. They know the guy didn't take the picture. So this was probably a fake. In the report, the guy who did the post said he admitted to posting the sale as a joke. Uh, he further stated he thought the incident was part of a storyline for AEW shows and not legitimate. You see, coming back to that whole, is this a wrestling angle or is this the real thing? So that kind of, you know, is a red herring that police have to go, go down that path and start um, searching for the belt and start going after because they were worried someone would post it online. And someone did, but it was a fake. It was bogus. So here's where things get a little weird in this case, which I want to talk to the detective about. So someone does find the belt. <clears throat> um, so a guy... This would have been September 4th, three days later. A guy walks into, oh, I want to back up real quick. They did find some um, surveillance video at the airport and the detect and the investigators wrote, it should be noted that they did review Jericho's SUV pulling up a few times. They say it should be noted that no items were placed on the roof of the vehicle and no items were seen hanging out of the rear of the vehicle as soon as it departed the terminal on both occasions. That means it likely didn't fall off. Like they accidentally put it on the roof and it fell off somewhere on the road. So something else happened. So around 6 p.m. on September 4th, three days after the belt is disappears, they write this. A guy um, walked into the duty office of the police station and turned in the championship belt. So he meets with in the lobby of the police station, and the guy said he was returning home from a scalloping trip on the coast the evening the belt was disappeared. He said around 6 p.m., he found the discarded belt in the turn lane of Highway 20. Now, police have no reason to necessarily disbelieve this guy has been interviewed in some media outlets about what happened that night but here was the odd part that I talked to the detective about coincidentally when he walks into the police precinct to turn in the belt you know who's sitting in the police precinct the owner of the limo company the owner of the limo company whose driver was the last person to see the belt Three days after the disappearance, coincidentally, the exact same time the man who found the belt walks in with it, the owner of the limo company happens to be sitting in the lobby. Is that a coincidence or not? Can it be explained away as coincidence? Maybe. We're going to talk to the, uh, the veteran police detective about that in a bit. Um, a couple things that I want to read from this final report on this about that is it should be noted that the man who found the belt became very, this is written in here, should be noticed the man who found the belt became very nervous and started fidgeting when asked about communicating with the owner of the limo company or the company itself and repeatedly stated he needed to leave before he abruptly walked off. Throughout the investigation, I had communications with the limo company owner who showed me the GPS data for the vehicle on his phone. The vehicle did not make any prolonged stops and followed the exact path as it had traveled from the Millionaire Club at the airport to the Longhorse Steakhouse on the first trip. Um, I requested the limo owner send me the GPS data and never received a copy for impound. Um, 
to further my investigation, I obtained surveillance video from local businesses along the vehicle travel route. I attempted to retrieve surveillance footage from several locations. Um, he obtained video from one auto center and he reviewed the footage and was only able to observe Irvine's vehicle turn onto that area on its first trip from the, the millionaire place, the airport. I did not see any objects lying in the roadway which would match the belt bag containing the belt. I was never able to locate the vehicle or a vehicle matching that description. At this time, all investigative leads had been followed. Due to the lack of evidence, probable cause could not be established, and an identity as to who or how the belt was removed from the vehicle could not be established. At this time, it is unknown how the belt was removed from the vehicle and ended up in the area of Bluntstown Highway where the man locates it. At this time, this case is being classified as open, inactive, pending any further investigatory leads. That's kind of where it was left. I do want to point out, I want to bring up real quick, Jericho was quick to get on this because he knew the, the nation was watching, and he puts this tweet out talking about he got his belt back. And he's sitting over there with his shoulder with a little bit of the bubbly in his left hand, um, and he put out this video uh, very much in character saying that he was responsible for getting the belt back. Let's listen. It's because I put the fear of God into the hearts of those who robbed me, who committed grand larceny. I told you I hired the best professional private investigators in the world today. And as a result, I got back the most coveted prize in professional wrestling today. So uh, he was saying he got it back. That's kind of where the story ended. But something that seemed off was that they could never quite get a great answer or any specific detail through GPS data or surveillance video of how this AEW title belt just magically fell into the middle of a roadway. Um, and then there's the way it was turned in. You know, two people involved in this case coincidentally in the room at the same time three days later in the police precinct. So I want to bring in um, retired chief of detectives of the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, Tom Hackney. Tom, as I said, is, is done more high profile cases than probably any detective out there. High profile, kidnapping, murder, oversaw all the detectives in his huge agency. So he's dealt with just all sorts of detective work. That's what he's good at. He's retired now. So I sent him these, uh, investigative reports, the five reports we have from Tallahassee PD to kind of go through with me. He said some things didn't totally add up. He might have done some things differently. And here's our interview with retired chief of detectives in Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, Tom Hackney. Well, we are joined now by retired and veteran police detective out of Jacksonville, Tom Hackney, who's one of the top detectives for the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, one of the biggest local police agencies in the state of Florida for many years. Tom, thanks for joining us today. Hey, Scott, thanks for having me, buddy. So tell me about this. You looked at the police reports with me here and you said some things stuck out to you. Talk to me about what you saw when you started looking through this investigation. Well, you know, Scott, after, after 30 years of doing investigations, one thing I've learned, and it, you know, it's not a forever, but uh, there are few things that are coincidences when you look at an investigation. And in looking through this investigation, uh, the coincidence where the person that found it and the other parties involved just happened to be there, that raised a whole lot of red flags for me when I looked at this. So if you had been a detective and that walks into your precinct, that's something that's going to set off a warning bell. How, how would you handle that? I, I really feel like a, a lot more uh, pointed questioning uh, could have taken place. There are other things that, you know, forensically that could have been done. I, I didn't see any, any evidence that they had looked at phone records and, and cell phone records. Nowadays, my goodness, those, those make or break cases. And uh, he didn't just so happen across that belt without talking to somebody. And if there was a connection, that would certainly lay, uh, lay that framework out from, from what the connection was. You've dealt with a lot of uh, high-profile cases over the years. I've worked on a lot of them with you. You know, this is kind of different, though, because it's, it's, it's entertainment. It's, it's probably making the rounds on the Internet and social media. 
Does that make it difficult from a police perspective? It, it can and it can't. Um, so it, we call these things eight cases, APE cases. They're a political emergency. So it's it's something like this that happens. That this is this is of notoriety. Uh, this is something that is well known, and that can work for you and against you. Uh, it can work for you because it's a recognizable thing. This this belt isn't going to just be easily traded hands uh, in in a public setting. Uh, somebody's going to recognize this j- just kind of like it happened, and it. it it can help you with that. It can also hurt you because it can drive people underground. If somebody had this and sees the news coverage of it, they can think, oh my goodness, I I need to get rid of this. I need to throw it in the trash can. It could wind up in a dumpster. It really makes a case like this more challenging, but it also highlights the fact that, that because of its nature, you, you need to put more resources towards it. You say resources, what do you mean by that? More detectives, more people going out and asking questions. What do you mean by more resources? Well, not, you know, manpower resources, you know, you got the, the, the human asset that you could use, uh, assign an additional detective, you, know, you, you talk to, in a case like this, I mean, the value of this thing is, is $30,000 plus, dollars, plus mm-hmm. its collectible value, plus, plus you know, the value of, of the folks who have, have given blood, sweat, and tears to earn it. Uh, you know, it, you, you call it an entertainment piece, but you know, this, is, this is somebody's life work. Here. Uh-huh. And you want to put the put the effort towards that. So you've got the, the the human resources that you could put to it with more detectives. But but again, like I kind of talked about, phone records, uh, some DNA. Uh, I would be curious to see who's who's touched DNA was on this. You know, there there are just other forensic things that that could be done or could have been done in this case to to bring it to a, a better conclusion. I want to ask you about the victim in this case, who is Chris Irvine is his real name. The public knows him as Chris Jericho. When you guys deal, and you probably dealt with some high-profile victims before, do you deal with them the same as everyone else, or or is it just kind of a different thing? You know, you, you, you try to deal with them. I mean, at the end of the day, Scott, they're people, uh, and they are, they are victims of, of a crime, and it's it's really... It's interesting because it, at the end of the day, when you become a crime victim, I don't care who you are, it, it changes the, the complexion of who you are. Once, once somebody has been a victim of a crime, it really kind of whittles down everything else. It, it whittles down uh, finances, it whittles down stature to the fact that, that you've been taken advantage of either personally or, or physically. And, and you just, from an investigator standpoint, you just want to deal with them like people. The best way that I would teach my detectives to treat people, imagine you were the person who's who's had this happen to them. You treat those people like you want them, like you would want your your family treated. If, if your family had an item stolen or a house broken into, it, that's how you do it. There were uh, a number of instances throughout this investigation where it looked like surveillance video was available, but nothing really seemed to turn up anything useful. Is surveillance video? a guaranteed solution in cases like these, or does it not always give you everything you need? It, it's not the panacea that, that people who are in investigations think it is. You know, you think, ah, oh, there's videos everywhere. And in today's date and time, there are more available video recordings from ring cameras, from businesses set up. But it, you may have a video, but it, it may just show an outline of a person, and it doesn't really help. Um, it, it gives you a better feel for, for what may have happened. And in a case like this, it, it helped a little with trying to establish a timeline, which, which was useful for this. Um, but that in this particular case, even highlighted some of the other facts that, that I would want to know is, okay, in, these, in this timeline, something had to happen. Uh, it didn't happen at the, at the airport. It didn't happen at the restaurant. Where, where, did, this, where did this happen? And so it, it helps lay out that timeline that, that you can use as an investigative tool to, to kind of put you where you need to be. And this issue of the the coincidence, when the guy comes to turn in the belt after he says he posted it on Craigslist, then brought the listing down because he found out this is a pup, what it was. I uh, said he found it on the side of the road. He's there the same time as the guy um, who I think owned the limo company, but the bleach report narrative says they didn't appear in the lobby to know each other. That that would be a big thing that would stand out to you like a red herring. 
Oh yeah. I mean, that is, that is absolutely something that needs more and, and a harder look than I think it was truly given. Um, obviously if, if they're in this together and you make some assumptions uh, that maybe, maybe they were, again, I don't believe in coincidences in investigations. If I see a coincidence, I'm going to have to prove it better than it just so happenstance happened. Um, they're naturally not going to act like they know each other. If, if somehow they're connected, uh, somehow they're buddies, again, those phone records or, or some other kind of physical evidence would, would tie them together. Uh, I mean, it, it, if I, detectives I needed to question them, would you separate? I've, I've seen this on TV cop stuff. I don't know how real it is. Do, do you separate them and ask them individual questions? Yeah, you you know you want to to walk them through a timeline in a in a separate location in a separate interview room and and you want to establish where they are and to find out if there truly are any holes in in either story if if their stories are are true then it's going to kind of show itself in in an investigation in a, in an interview. But it seems like in this case, it was kind of shrugged off as eh, they didn't look like they knew each other. So I, I guess they didn't. And, and Is that I'm a reality? Not- and and I, I don't want to you know, say anything negative about different police. But, you know, is that a reality sometimes in the world that, you know, the item has been recovered? Let's move on. Or is it, is it kind of a case by case basis? I, I think it's a case by case basis. You, you, you know, one of the things that so a property crime like this uh, you, you usually get a newer detective that that gets assigned to a burglar unit or or, or theft investigations like this. And, and why is that? It, is that because the like the murder cases? That's for your more veteran detectives, right? I mean, you want you want your your highest skilled detectives working on murder cases, working on sex crimes cases, uh, but these detectives need to cut their teeth somewhere. So you know, although the new detectives do go to these type of investigations. The good thing is they're, they're wanting to show their wares. They're wanting to, to kind of test themselves on these cases. And, and sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad, where they may not have all the skills of, of knowing how to, how to do these interviews, how to, how to do a harder uh, uh, interrogation, take it from an interview to an interrogation, to do a couple more things forensically with, with cell phone records and, and really pinpoint some of that information. That's kind of where you lose it. I'm not necessarily suggesting that was the case, but it kind of appears that way. And, you know, every, every case stands on its own merit and every detective, you know, tries to set out and do the best thing. Would a supervisor have to sign off on this at the end? Yes, without a doubt. So that's, you know, having, having gone through the different levels of investigations that I have starting from a detective and move them all the way, all my way up. Everything is a learning experience. You know, as a detective, you you have a toolbox of, of skills and you want to use that toolbox for the next investigation. And, it, you know, so I maybe haven't ever dealt with cell phone records like this. I haven't done this and that. And when you kind of put that in your toolbox for the next time, and that's where the supervisors in the investigations level really need to, to act as mentor and coach to their new detective. One, la- one last question for you. So in a higher profile crime, a, a murder or, or a violent crime of some sort, you're going to have a victim that's very wanting justice. Is it possible the victim here, that would be Chris Jericho and all elite wrestling, they just wanted their belt back. And once that was accomplished, maybe there wasn't the push for justice that we see in other high profile cases? It's possible. Um, you know, there is that feeling that once my property is recovered, uh, you know, let's just let's just move on. But it's it's really incumbent upon not only the investigating detectives in that agency, but also the state attorney for that area to to really move through. So so somewhere there's a guy who made a decision to take a thirty thousand dollar object that didn't belong to him. And that person needs justice. And I think without answered justice, you run the risk of of another type of crime going. And, um, you know, was it a crime of opportunity? Did somebody look in a bag and say, hey, that. That's pretty cool. I would like that myself. I could make some money from that. I could do this. That's that's the kind of person that needs to answer for that. And I think just as an investigator, just to kind of brush it off and say, yeah, they, they, they got their thing back and, and let's move on. Even the victim may want that. I still have a, a duty to to make sure that a person is brought to justice to answer for, for that kind of crime. 
Well, retired detective Tom Hackney. Tom, thanks so much for joining us today on the show. Anytime, buddy. Thank you. Now, I want to point out, despite the fact that there was a suspicious nature of how the belt was turned in, no one was ever charged with a crime. One of the reasons why we're not naming anyone in this, uh, in our coverage of this. Um, but, you know, Tom there talked about suspicions he had. So the two men who were kind of there when the belt was returned, I reached out to both. And I want to talk to you a little about that. First, I want to talk to you about, I spoke in the last few days to the owner of the limo company. And he told me a few things. He said, quote, and we can put the quotes up, guys. Um, he walks in and showing to the lady at the desk, and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me, talking about the fact that he's literally sitting in the police precinct and he sees a guy walk in with the belt at the same time he's sitting there. Um, and he uh, then go a little further. He says, he, he told me he don't think they set it on top of the vehicle about as far as the belt. He doesn't remember them ever setting it on top of the vehicle. Surveillance video kind of said that was the case. Um, he also said, bags were packed high. Don't think hatchback could have come open. So, you know, he, he didn't quite know how it would have fallen out. And then he said he, he never could understand how it got out of the vehicle onto the street. Now, I want to give this guy, I want to say, first off, I called this guy out of the blue. He hadn't thought about this case in four years. So he was kind of a little, you know, caught off guard when I call him, but he was nice enough to, you know, talk to me. And he told me he, he, the, he thinks, if he remembers right, he gave the guy who found it a reward, again, like a hundred bucks or something, and said, you know, thanks for your help. And that's what it is. I asked isn't it kind of coincidentally you guys were there at the same time? He says it was a coincidence. He couldn't believe it either. I also called the guy who found it. I called a number listed for a family member of his um, and, and did not receive a call back. Not that that means anything. This is an old case. I understand that. But he did speak to the Tallahassee Democrat, the newspaper out there. I want to read a couple of quotes he gave in 2019 when this had its immediate coverage. He said, quote, it's pretty comical. It's like the start up for a great screenplay. The story could have gone in so many other funny directions. There are so many funny twists to it. Um, I think I said something like, whoa, it's a huge wrestling belt. Check out this thing out. I never would have guessed that if I had a lifetime of guesses. It was The, the article was kind of almost tongue in cheek, kind of happy go lucky, like what a, what a story. Um, and that's kind of where it's at. I mean, they didn't make an arrest. They didn't get the answer to how the belt got where it did. Um, and there were some kind of left unanswered, kind of confusing questions lingering, but there was only so much that could be done. Um, I did reach out to All Elite Wrestling and asked them if they wanted to comment on this. They've been very good media partners with us. They said, just in this case, they would rather not. Um, I understand that. It's a police investigation. You probably don't need to you know, bring this back up as, as a company. Um, but that's kind of where it's at. Chris has spoken out about this uh, here and there over the years. And once again, Chris, if you're watching, uh, we'd love to have you on to talk about this or any other subject. But that's kind of where it's at. A, a convoluted way, right as AEW names its first champion, that this belt is missing and then just magically shows back up. Probably a hard thing to sell underground because it's identifiable. You know, I mean... If someone stole this, they may not want to keep it because, you know, that's a hot item. That's not, that's not something you can have above board and show off because it's been in the news. There's been articles. People know that the belt is missing. So what are you going to do with it? Um, no arrests. And there was a, I mean, they did police, they did some ping phone locations. They showed phone logs. They did, they did find some surveillance video that questioned witnesses. Tom, who we spoke with, says maybe a little more could have been done, but they, there wasn't nothing done. Um, Tom suspected the investigator might have been an earlier, a younger detective. As he said, oftentimes in, in theft and grand theft cases, they're not as veteran as the homicide guys. They're working on other crimes. Uh, so that's where it's at. I, it was interesting um, that he called it an ape case, like an apolitical emergency or something like that, because you have high-profile stolen item, high-profile victims. Obviously, they knew that they needed to put the resources in this to make sure that it was resolved, and then it was resolved. I mean, they got the belt back. Is it no harm, no foul? Could more have been done? Hard to say. 
But last report that they had, they said, um, at this time, this case is being classified as open, inactive, pending any further investigatory leads. That was uh, 2019. Actually, no, it looks like this was signed off um, April of 2020. So that's about th a little more than three years ago. So that's kind of where it's at. So that is the tale of the stolen AEW title belt in Tallahassee, Florida. Apparently found in the middle of a road. And a guy a few days later decided to turn it into the police station. Just a, a story that seems like it should have been one for the storyline, but this wasn't a storyline. This was reality. When reality and pro wrestling mix, it is an intriguing story. And we wanted to de uh, detail it here on Going Ringside. So thanks for joining us today. We really enjoy it and hope you can tune in again for the next time we join us here on Going Ringside. This has been Going Ringside with The Local Station, brought to you every Wednesday on your favorite podcast player, on News 4 Jax Plus, as well as the News 4 Jax YouTube channel.